Hello. First of all, I want to take this opportunity to let you know who I am. I'm Charles Morgan with Word is Live Ministries. Uh, I want to thank everyone who helps support this ministry, uh, radio and internet. After 20 plus years in the ministry, it's a little bit different doing this, but uh, has been enjoyable uh, seeing uh, people respond. Uh, sometimes it's a little uh, different in the way people respond, but at least they're listening, and I appreciate that. I think some question what I say, but that's all right, too. Uh, perhaps that will get them more in the Word and uh, realize that uh, they can learn, too. Uh, and We all can learn. I learn every single day. Every time I study the Bible, I find out more that I don't know that I need to know and uh, very interested in learning. This morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 24. Jesus says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no th saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things do the Greeks seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. All right. Uh, we're not talking about two masters today. We're going to be talking about the way that God provides, and it's a, it's an amazing thing. And, and what he's really saying here, uh, first of all, he says you can't serve two masters. You can't be under uh, the rule of two masters. Uh, he said you'll, you'll hate one, love the other, love the other, hate this one. You know, you can't do it. And what he's talking about is the difference in our, our prioritization of our life between the world and Jesus. And he's telling us exactly where this priority needs to be. It said, no man can serve two masters. And that's true. You can't serve two masters. You can't, uh, you can't be there. You know, I, I've, I've done this myself, try to work two jobs and you end up in a, in a kind of a pickle when they both want you to work at the same time. And you, you, it just doesn't work out most of the time uh, in that respect. And it sure doesn't work out at all when you try to put something else ahead of God. Uh, when you try to put anybody in a, a different place, you're going to have to lower somebody else. You're going to have to have that prioritization. Uh, uh, Maslow's uh, uh, triangle of of, uh, of needs shows where you got to put these things. And and here's you know Jesus said, it, "Give me the preeminence." What does that mean? The number one spot. If you will put Jesus in the number one spot. The rest of those things will fall into place because you'll have a difference in your attitude and your your way of looking at things. Your perspective on things will change. And I, I promise you it will if you will do that. Here's a problem we've got. Uh, each and every single one of us, we look at things and we start saying, we can handle this. We can do this. We can make this work. Uh, I have been terrible with that in my life, you know, of, of looking at it and go, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. And, and it doesn't work. Uh, somehow it falls apart, my plans and everything that I've tried to do. Uh, some people think, well, I, I've had it uh, and I've worked it out. But in the end, it crumbles. And then they, they have trouble trying to figure out what was going on here. Uh, we as Christians are to become new creatures. Our our focus is to be different. Everything about us is to be different. Uh, he just says you can't serve God and mammon. Uh, many people have uh, uh, denoted this to be money, uh, but it can be anything. 
It can be anything that you place above him. If it's money, if it's uh, your career, if it's your family, and you say, yeah, wait a minute, I, my family should be number one. No, that's not true. Uh, your family should not be number one. Christ should be number one. And all that will be in its place. But he goes on to talk about our needs. What are our needs? And, and uh, he talks about food and clothing. And he talks extensively about these. Now, he was talking to these people that were around him, but this is, this is relevant to us today. And you say, well, how so? Because we're set in such a different world. We're dealing with so many different things. Uh, we've got all these different problems. They had the same problems. I, I'm telling you right now, it all boils down to food, clothing, and I would, I would put in shelter. Uh, you know, and God provides for those. Now, does he give you exactly what you want? No. And that's the point right here, that so many want more than what God is going to provide. They, they just, uh, set their sights. They say, well, this is what I want. I want, I want this house. I want this car. I want these things. You know, I've seen so many things on the Internet now uh, with uh, prices going up and, and uh, people saying, well, you're going you're gonna to realize now, this younger generation, uh, why your grandparents lived the way they did. And I, I can relate to that. When I was growing up, uh, we had one car. Uh, you use that car, and uh, if my dad was gone with it, we didn't have a car there. You know, if if we had to do something different, we try to try to work that out. Uh, when I took my my driver's test when I was fourteen, and I've, I related my story to my family, you know, our, our family car wasn't available that day, and uh, I ended up taking an old farm truck of my granddad's that uh, was really dirty and smelled really bad. But uh, hey, it worked. I got my driver's license, and that was the point that I needed. Uh, and they said, well, that's the only one available today. You either take that or you don't take it today. And it had been delayed. So I've, I've lived through that. Many of you that are listening to my voice right now, see, I, I remember that as well, but God provided for us. We had a vehicle, um, and we were able to do, and, and people that didn't have one that God had not provided that, uh, uh, people would help out and, and work and we would do things. So, uh, Things have become more complicated in our minds. I, I've no doubt about that. There are too many things within our lives. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing to me. Uh, if you go out to eat, you look over at a table and you see a family there, and none of them are looking at one another. They're not talking. Uh, they're on their devices, whatever that device is, communicating with something. Uh, I saw family one day, and and I. Uh, the dad was just, uh, he was sitting there feverishly on his device, and, and they all were. And we went up to pay at the same time, and I said, hey, hey, dude, because hey, he was still on it. I said, what are you doing? And he, he, I'm playing video poker. So he was sitting there playing video poker during his lunch hour, I found out, uh, that he'd taken to, to eat with his family. And his family was still over there looking at their stuff. And, you know, I thought, you know, we, we've lost it. We've lost our our communications, our eye contact. So yes, there are many things that are distractions today. So maybe we do have more distractions, but it still boils down to the same thing. Folks, when it all comes down to it, it's food that we need, clothing that we need, some sort of covering. We we have to have these. And uh, I think that's one of the things that, uh, like say in churches, fellowship meals are so important because that's a great equalizer. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, how much money you have or don't have. When you sit down at a meal, you're common. You're you're doing a common thing that you have to do, and it's an equalizer. So we can sit there and we can we can begin to talk when we do that because it brings us to a a, a common level and and place. And so Jesus is talking about this, but he's talking to these people that are believers. And what do they seek after? What are they going after? He said, uh, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now, does that mean that you don't care about yourself? That's not at all what Jesus is trying to get across. And people will try to twist verses and they'll say, well, well, you're trying to say this. No, I'm, I'm telling you what Jesus is saying and what we can get from this is that he's saying, don't make that the priority in your life. Don't say, oh, well, I've got to do this. I've got to do that for myself. Uh, we've got to follow after Jesus. When we start following after Jesus and he starts providing, there are are selfless times. We're not thinking of self. We're, we're, we start looking at others and, and, and wanting them to have Christ and wanting them to have salvation and, and knowing that, hey, this is, this is short, this life. I'm telling you right now, I, you know, I, I was thinking this morning, I was, I was thinking back about 
how short it really is, you know, and, and the older you get, the more you really feel that way. And I was looking uh, forward when I was a younger man and, and 60 years seemed like uh, such a great time and a lengthy time, you know, and I re remember uh, my grandfather, they had a big deal for his, uh, his 60th birthday. And I, I was just, you know, I was around 10 or 11 at the time. And I'm thinking, Phew, man, so old and that's so so far in the future and and right now i'm, I'm staring it down the, the barrel about a year and a half away and and i'm thinking that's that really wasn't that's a short ride boy i didn't get much out of that carnival ride uh but you know we we diff, have a different perspective when we start thinking about things differently when we become a christian and we we realize that life is short and this is not what it's all about we got something greater, and, and folks, I'm, I'm going to speak to the Christians this morning, and I want you to, to, to just sit back a little bit. Sit back. Put down everything. I mean everything, and just, just start talking to the Lord a little bit here, and then continue to talk to the Lord a little bit until it's, it's a great conversation about where we are, what our perspective is, and what are we really doing. Even within our churches, as we go to church, what is our perspective? What is it? But it starts with self. Where are we? So uh, Jesus starts out, and he said, uh, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. That's they don't plant. They don't plant anything. They don't have that. Uh, it's amazing. I love wildlife. Uh, you know, I love hunting, and some of you are probably against that, but that's okay. Uh, uh, but I, I more than anything, I love being out there and watching these animals and the way that God provides for them. You know, and the, the acorns that come, the seeds that are out there for for uh, various animals, the berries, the things that are provided for them. And I, so I can relate to this, and I can look at it, and he said, they don't sow, uh, they don't reap, they don't gather it up in the barns, they don't keep stuff, you know. Uh, we want to, some people are hoarders, and some people are just, you know, well, I got to have this, I got to have that, and, you know, for the rainy day type thing. And there's nothing wrong with planting a little bit, but when we put everything into that, uh, we're, for, we're forgetting about Christ. And he said, so these animals, they don't know him. He said, and your heavenly Father, feeds them. He said, are you not much better than they? He asked a question, but this is a rhetorical question that he's asking everybody to get them to, to start thinking. Paul was great about this too, to get them to think, to, to say, yes, yes, we are. We were created for fellowship with God. That's why he created us. Now, the fall of man happened when Adam sinned and, and uh, uh, willingly sin, knew he was sinning and, and went against God. And so the man, the fall happened, but Jesus Christ came to remedy that, to allow us to have that back again so that we can be with him again. And, there, and he said himself, there's no way to heaven, there's no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. God himself came down to earth. He had this plan. He made all of this so that we could have that, and he provides for us here. Now, it may not be the greatest that you want, you know, maybe you got some expensive taste and, and you're not getting that. And you say, well, I really wanted this, but, you know, I've got this. Accept it. Take it. Say, like, Lord, thank you for this. You know, you, you feed the animals. You feed me. Uh, thank you so much for this. This is why we sit down at our meal and people say, say grace. I, I say thank you. And it doesn't have to be. And I've told my kids, you know, I'm, that's not my prayer time. The meal time is not my prayer time. Uh, I have a different prayer time where I focus in and I have a conversation with God and and uh, meditate upon Him and get with Him. But you know that that is a time that I'm thanking Him for the food that's in front of me right there. And so I'm not going to go into elaborate prayer. And I, I've seen people do this, and if they want to do this, especially in restaurants, I think I think most of it is for show. Honestly, uh, you say, "Well, you don't know that." No, I don't know that. But when you're praying real loud so everyone can hear you, and so that you became the main attraction, it's no longer about Christ. It's no longer about thanking Him for the food. It's about so everyone can look at you and go, "Isn't that great?" Or, "That's terrible," you know. So, but we sit down, we thank Him for this food because He is the provider of it. And I've taught my kids this from day one. And I, I, I preached about it. You know, we should be thankful for every morsel we get. I don't care what it is. And it, it uh, should be thanked for because he is the one that provides us. So he's talking about food here. And in verse 27, he kind of throws this in. It's what I was talking about, how we can control things and why we think we can. But, you know, he was dealing with people there who were probably saying, well, 
I work, I get money, I get food. You know, this is the way this works. So it's all about me. But then he says this, he said, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? How can anybody sit there and think about things and make themselves grow? Get it, it, taller than they are is what he's talking about. No, we can't do that, can we? Uh, if we could do that, there wouldn't be any gray hair, would there? Uh, we'd say, Phew, I'm going to do this. And, and we wouldn't have to get it out of a bottle or whatever you get. And uh, I've seen some things, you know, for men and, and color their hair and do these things. And you can, if you're, uh, if you watch the videos, you know that uh, uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not worried about it. You know, I'm, I'm uh, okay with that white hair coming on. It's, it's, it's all right with me. And, uh, but I can't change it. I can't change it. I can't just sit there and think, boy, I wish that beard was red again. Or, you know, I wish I didn't have the gray flecks in my hair or whatever it is. Or I wish I was taller. Or I wish my, you know, I was uh, stronger. I mean, it just, we can't do this. And that's what he's posing to everybody here. And he's posing this to us today. Can you do that? No, there is no way. So we can't control these other things. And he's, he's asking them this so that they can understand where he's coming from. Jesus had a way with people. If we will read his words, he had a way with people, but he was very direct as well. People say, oh, well, Jesus never would have said that. You don't know who Jesus is. Jesus was very direct when he had to be direct. He, he told people just like it was. We say, well, we should sit back and let everybody just do whatever they want. You know, he didn't condemn the, the woman caught in adultery, uh, but he did tell her to go and sin no more. He told her he didn't condemn her, but he, he said to Nicodemus, the world's condemned already. He didn't have to condemn her. That was the point. He said, I'm not condemning you. I'm not, but you need to, to stop this. Go and sin no more. So Jesus was very direct when he had to be. He was very thought-provoking. He wanted people to understand what he was saying. So he wasn't using huge words. And Paul said that himself. He said, I don't come to you with excellency of words. He said, that's not what it's about. I want you to understand what I'm saying. I've listened to some people sometime and, and, and I, some, I think, don't even understand that they're doing it. And, and they speak in such terms that you come away going, I don't even know what they said. Uh, they were doing this and this and they were, you know, they've got a huge vocabulary. But in the end of it, I really didn't understand what they were trying to get across. And so we want that and Jesus wants that. He wants him to understand that. So he asked him the question, can you do this? The obvious answer is no. Okay, what does that do? That sets the tone for what he's going to talk about next. He's going to talk about uh, consider the uh, your raiment. If I take you thought for raiment, okay? So he's talking about food. Now he's talking about clothing. Now your raiment, your clothing, those those things that you you wear, you know, that keep you warm in the the winter, you know, and and maybe look stylish or whatever you want it to do. But they cover our bodies. Uh, granted, it's getting more and more where people don't cover as much of their bodies as they should. And I, I'm telling you right now, uh, some of you got no reason to try to uncover your body. Uh, you know, you, you haven't taken care of yourself and, and, and you shouldn't be doing that. And you say, well, you shouldn't be talking about them. Uh, I don't do that. And I understand that. But nobody should be going in the ways that some people do. They want to show every part of their body. And we're not to be doing that. We shouldn't be doing that. And if you disagree with that, too bad, you're wrong. And it says, why, why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. Flowers. Flowers. And, you know, that's, that's the thing, too. We, we've gone through a little period here of spring, and, and uh, we've uh, seen flowers come out and, and love them. And, and I, I especially love, love uh, roses, and I look at them and try to take care of them. And, and they're so beautiful to my eye. You know, they come out, and, and they have this... But, it's there for a little while, and then it fades. Uh, irises, and, and believe me, I don't know a whole lot about flowers. I know a few. I know what a peony looks like because uh, my wife had one one time, and I thought it was just a bunch of weeds, and, and I mowed right over it. Boy, took it out. And so I learned what a peony looks like so I can avoid those. So I do know that, and I know a couple of other flowers. I'm not great with that, but I do appreciate their beauty. Even the wild flowers that grow out in the woods, some of them, uh, I've seen some of these little purple flowers, little white flowers that come out, and uh, they're, they're beautiful, but then they fade away. And that's what he's talking about. He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. So they come up, and they're beautiful, you know, and they, they're, they're arrayed in a way that's is just catching to the eyes. It's got colors and, and, and aromas and things like that. So think about those. 
Think about the beauty of them. Think about how they come out. He said, and how they grow. Uh, they're not there, and, and all of a sudden they are. They're, they're, uh, we, didn't, we didn't make them that way. We may plant them. Uh, we may nourish them, but we can't make it have a flower. I can't go out there and go, flower now. That's not the way it works. So we see them, and we see them grow, and it said, they toil not. They're not working. They're not, they're not going out and gathering up stuff. For their nourishment. They're not doing that. They don't, they don't think about those things. That's not what they're about. He said, neither do they spin. So they don't make these things. He said, and yet, I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now these people knew Solomon. You say, who, who was Solomon? Solomon was perhaps the greatest uh, uh, man for wisdom and riches in Israel's history ever he had so many riches he had wisdom you know and, and uh people would come from all around he would send off and get materials to to build what he wanted to build and people would come in to see him and so they understood this and that's who he was so he's talking about the guy that you look up to so much the guy that you think had it all the thing that uh, he had riches so much that he had every bit of clothing he wanted uh beautiful uh, silks or whatever it was that he desired that's what he had and he said think about him and he said even solomon didn't look as beautiful as these flowers you look at them and they're so pretty and and he couldn't match it maybe he was trying to mimic it some people do you know we try to mimic them in some ways and he said Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, so it's here today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. It's withered. It's dried. And, you know, I've, I've uh, heard some people talk and done a little study on this, and they would go out and gather this stuff up and use it for their fires, you know, to cook with and things like that. And so that's what he's talking about. He said, it's, it's nothing anymore. Uh, you don't look at it and say it's beautiful. In fact, you use it for your fire uh, and things like that. So, so uh, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? It's a question mark there. So consider these things. God will provide for you. He will do this. He'll provide a way. And, and that doesn't mean you just sit back. When he called Abram, he said, come out, follow me. And, you know, some would say, well, you're saying that you don't have to work. You don't have to do that. No, Paul addressed this in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3 and 10, where he said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Because some of them had gotten to that point and said, oh, well, you know, I'll just sit back and do nothing. We've got a lot of people in our country that are that way, too. They've got that attitude. Uh, well, I shouldn't have to do anything. Uh, some of these uh, uh, political uh, uh, motives are set up to where they say, well, uh, everyone should have everything they want and not have to do anything. Well, that's not the way it is either. So I'm not saying that. I'm not telling you not to work. I'm telling you not to prioritize it in the way that we do and and to think that we do these things to give credit to god when credit is due which is all the time give him the credit for what he's provided for you you say well i've got a great job then god provided that job you said no 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 i went out and got it yourself what i'm trying to tell you is what we're going to get to and what jesus is saying when he culminates this is that everything flows from him it's all about him so he says, uh, take no thought. He said, therefore, take no thought. So don't do this, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? He said, the Gentiles, the non-saved people, those are the ones that think about that thing. Those are the ones that focus upon those things. Where is your focus today? Is your focus upon what you can do and how you can do it and how you uh, uh, arrange things? Or is it about Jesus Christ? He said the Gentiles and not Christians. You look around, and I'm telling you again and again and again and again, one of the reasons that non-Christians, non-saved people don't see any benefit in Christianity is because they look at us and they see us with the same attitude as they've got. We're worried about things. We're worried about where our next paycheck is going to come from. We're worried about all kinds of things. We're worried about gas prices right now. Uh, and, and yeah, they're, they're outrageous. Uh, lack of food on the shelves. Yeah, that's terrible. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a reality, but are you fretting over that? Are you losing sleep over that? So many people are, you know, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing. So then we get to verse 33, 
which is the focus of my sermon today and leading up to this. But he said, but seek ye first. See, he's talking about all these things, and now he says, but. So here's what you're supposed to be doing. So he tells us what not to do. We're not supposed to be focusing on clothing. We're not supposed to be spoke, focusing on, on food. That's not where every ounce of our energy is supposed to go. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now look, he didn't say our righteousness. He didn't say making ourselves look better. He didn't say what we're supposed to be doing. He said his righteousness. This is where we're supposed to be. He said, I've told you this, so I'm going to tell you exactly what you do. So he spent all this speaking of what we should not be doing and giving us examples of how God provides and letting us know that we can't do it ourselves. And then he brings it to this of what we should be doing. Seek ye first. Number one, this is how you do it. You know, this is like an instruction book. Uh, you get these things and, and uh, you, you lay them out there and you say, step one. Step two. So you got to do step one before you get to step two. It's like uh, building something. A lot of times you've got to put this first before you can put this over it so that it drains water and things like that. These are the priorities. This is how it all works. And if you will do it in this way, it will all be prioritized right. And God will do what he says. These are promises. Jesus is saying these are promises. We should rely upon these promises. We should look at this and say, Lord, I know you're going to do it. Show me the right way. Show me where I should step out. Show me where I should do the, the right thing. Be open to that. That's what this is all about. If you're seeking Jesus Christ first, if you're seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, you're going to be studying his word. You're going to be speaking to him often. You're going to be teaching your family about this. You're going to be teaching others about this through your life and through your words and everything that you do because this is going to be, number one, your first priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We don't do that. And I'm, we've all fall victims of that. I'm not saying I never have because I, I have, and I'll tell you that right now, uh, and it was wrong. And when I caught myself, I realized what I was doing, trying to get back on the right path, and Jesus would show me the right way. But this is where we've got to get. And we can't just do it just on, and when things seem to be bad. Because this is what most people want to do. They want to do their own thing until it gets to the point where their own thing is not working. And then all of a sudden say, oh, well, I want, I want help now. But I don't really want your help. I just want you to make things better for me. But Jesus is saying, if you'll seek me first, if you'll put me first and seek my righteousness and everything, all these steps will be going along the way they should. Because after that, he said, and all these things, what things? The things he was just talking about, all these things, the clothing, the food, the way that he would provide. He said, all these things shall be added unto you. This is a promise. So what should we do? We should be having a relationship with Jesus Christ constantly, every day, putting him number one. Lord, what do you want me to do? Show me, guide my path. Put that illumination there so that I can see what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what we should be doing. And he says, Take no, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Tells me that our thoughts are where it's at. Where's our mind? Where's our mindset? You know, where is that? Is it focused on Jesus or is it focused on the morrow, which has got the evil there already? It's got the evil in this world. The world is evil. You say, well, I think there's some good in the world. Jesus Christ is good. He's the one. And those that are following him are following after good. But the world is evil and it's ruled by Satan right now, the prince of uh, darkness, because he is allowed to. Uh, he can't do anything he's not allowed to. But I'm telling you right now, one day Jesus Christ is going to come back. He is going to establish his kingdom and everything's going to be made right. I'm looking forward to that day. But in the meantime, I want to follow after him right now. I don't want to start once my life ends and say, oh, well, you know, uh, that's that's then, you know, and I've, I've heard people say, well, the, you know, you got this uh, part of your life here and you got this. No, it's it's all Jesus. And I've given the analogy of the pie. You know, we want to cut the pie up of our life and we want to prioritize this. Well, this is my career. This is my family. I'll have a bigger chunk from our career early on. And then if we end up with anything else, we say, well, Lord, here's yours but let me take a bite of it first. And what we ought to do is we ought to take that pie of our life and give it to Jesus and say, Jesus, priority number one is you. You cut my pie up. You cut my life up. You show it. 
You let me prioritize it. Maybe it's maybe it's for, so you can have a great career that you can provide for others as well. Or uh, maybe it's just that you provide for your family and you teach them, and, and one of them is going to go and, and be a great missionary. Whatever that is, allow him to do it, and Jesus will. Seek ye first. Who are you seeking first today? Number one, you've got to accept Christ as your Savior. Give your life to him. Not just your words, not just say some magic words, repeat after me type thing, but truly commit your life and then follow after him. That's the two things. And he said, these things shall be added unto you if you do that. I hope that that's what you've done. If you, and if you don't, I hope that you can accept Christ today. I want that free gift of salvation. For you Christians out there, this was mostly, mainly for you. I'll get it out. That we need to rely on him, especially in these bad times. Turn back to Christ. Put him number one. My name is Charles Morgan. I'm with Word is Alive Ministries. Thank you for allowing me to be with you today.